Hi, everyone, and welcome to the next section on named entity recognition. However, tonight, the first thing we're going to cover is WordNet. So basically, this chapter focuses on semantics and thinking about disambiguation based on either context or type of object. So this is really embedded into what I would consider a semantic analysis, which to recap, what we've learned so far is how to tag data sets for parts of speech and build your own part of speech tagger. And at the lowest level, that system of part of speech tagging is a very small measure of semanticity. So it's beginning to understand the meaning in a text. Not being, but beginning to understand the meaning in a text. And part of speech tells us a lot about meaning, even without knowing the literal meaning of the words that we are tagging, right? And so how could we get at the meaning of words if we aren't like literally looking them up? Well, we're gonna discuss how to explore WordNet and syn sets, which is really a great phrase for synonym groupings. We'll look at how to analyze lexical semantic relationships, and then we'll look at word disambiguation. So all of these things have to do with semantics. So this chapter, while well, it's called entity recognition, is really the first parts here about semantics. Okay. And then we'll end next week and talk about specifically named entity recognition. So WordNet, what is WordNet? Well, it's a large lexical database. It started in English and it has been expanded to other languages, but when people say WordNet, they generally mean the English version hosted by Princeton. It can be found online at wordnet.princeton. But we're going to use the package version of it, but here's what it looks like. It tells you a little bit about where WordNet is, how to use it, and if you are going to install this, how to download the software and get going. Okay, so it's here under download. But you can also use WordNet online directly without doing a whole lot. It uh, is maybe not the best layout, but let's say you want to look up the word cheese. It will give you some definitions for the word cheese. Okay. And we'll look about what all these things are here in a little bit. Okay. So remember that we discussed the difference before between function words, the and a and of, those parts of speech that are very frequent. Um, but aren't the meaning maker words in the sentence. So determinants, prepositions, um, conjunctions, that kind of stuff, stop words, and content words, the big four, adjectives, nouns, adverbs, and verbs. Okay. WordNet is a dictionary of content words. So it, in it can include adjectives, adjectives mm -hmm, nouns, adjectives, adverbs and verbs. So it doesn't include all of our function words. And if they are included, there's only a couple of them because they also happen to be a noun or an adjective. So the focus here is on dictionary definitions for content words. It has a hierarchical structure wherein every item is related to every other item in this giant sort of like tree fashion. So entity is the topmost item and then it trickles down getting more specific from there. So we'll look at that hierarchical structure. Okay. And words are clustered into what are called syn sets or synonym sets. And these are words of the same semantic meaning or very similar semantic meanings. So you would consider them synonyms, meaning they're very, you could exchange one for the other. And we talked about this, or we've talked about this in other ideas with polysemy where words have multiple meanings, this is two words that have the same meaning. It contains over 150,000 words grouped into about 120,000-ish sense sets and many word sense pairs. So our example here of cheese is a word sense pair, wherever I put cheese, here it is. Word, cheese, sense, meaning the way it's used, a solid prepared food versus a verb form where it's used to um, get away or stop, which is kind of an unusual version of the word cheese, honestly. Um, so I think of cheese as the food or like the thing that you say when everybody's trying to take a picture. Say cheese, right? 
So these are two different senses of the word. Versus a sense set, which is a grouping of words that are very similar, and then the word tokens themselves. And it can be accessed through an LTK in Python or the WordNet package in R. And so I've got my um, packages loaded here. And let's talk a little bit about sin sets before we get into using this. So sin sets are defined as words that are semantically similar or synonyms. They're not exactly the same, but they're centered around the same content, content or concepts. So they have similar features or similar, similar relations to other words. So turtle and tortoise, while two different types of creatures, are very similar because they're in the same family. They might also include collocations. These are multi-word combinations like peanut butter rather than just single words. And words with multiple senses or meanings for polysemes or polysemy words are noted and assigned to different sin sets. So cheese as a noun is assigned to a different sin set than cheese as a verb because cheese as a noun is a food, cheese as a verb is not food. So they're, you know, they're not all grouped together just because it's the same word. The sin sets are based on the definition. So let's try this in R. And I will tell you that I do not love the word net package in R in the least at all, because the objects that it returns are very awkward to work with. So the first thing you do in R is define the type of filter you want to use. So I'm gonna talk about this thing in just a second, but let's define the type of filter. So get term filter. I wanna say, okay, give me an exact match to this word. And I want that word to be fruit. You can do a regular expression match and several other objects types when you're looking for something like fruit or fruitful, or just give me an exact match to fruit. And so those filters can be contains. So contains will give me fruit and fruitful, right? Ends with exact match feature, regex filter, sound starts with, or wildcard. So you have some options here. Now, often when you load the WordNet library, you'll get this warning that it cannot find the WordNet dictionary. If that happens and you're on a Windows machine, you do have to make sure the software is installed first because it's separate than the package itself. There is a little software piece you download from their website. If you're on Windows, it might look something like this, right? Where it says set dictionary and you find the file location for our dictionary. I'm on a Mac, so it's currently hiding in my documents folder because that's where I stuck it. So if you don't have the dictionary loaded, it, this, none of this will work. So we've defined our filter, get an exact match for the word fruit. Now I want to define how I'm gonna get the related terms. So the indice can be noun, adjective, adverb, or verb, because there are no other types of words here. And so I want fruit as the noun. So if there are other fruit options, don't wanna see them, just wanna see fruit as the noun. And then last you say, here's that filter. So this says get the index terms that are of the noun type. Give me five possible sin sets to return and um, do that based on my filter, which is for fruit. So here's one reason that I really, well, first of all, that's kind of like this weird double layer of complexity. But second, the, the part I don't like about what it, gives you back is this weird Java object. To me, this looks a lot like JSON format, but it is very strange and very difficult to work with an R because either I have to parse this and then another round of things to, to like analyze, like use a regular expression to parse this, or I don't even know what, I like have a lot of trouble working with this thing. Okay. And the output is difficult to read. Now, from this, what I've done is I've pulled the definitions for fruit that have a noun. And here I can get sin sets. 
So from my terms, get the sin sets. And it's L apply because it comes back as a list. So pull all of the related words to fruit. And it does return it as a list, a list of Java objects that are still very difficult to work with. I mean, look at all this nonsense. Okay. So R loses this battle because the way to do this in Python is so much easier. All right. So what I want to do <clears throat> is from NLTK corp.corpus import WordNet. So it's built in NLTK. You don't have to install any extra dictionaries. How do I import pandas as PD? All right, so pull them in. Fruit sets is wordnet.sensets for fruit. I don't have to tell it that I want fruit as a noun. I could, but give me all of the related words to fruit, however fruit is defined. So the related words to fruit are um, literally fruit. <laughs> okay. The uh, uh, fruit as in the yield, the fruits of our labor, so yield, a separate fruit definition, a fruit as a verb, and a fruit as a verb part two. So this tells me all of the things that include the word fruit. Cool. Now I can convert that to a data frame instead of um, this list format and pull out all the information I might be interested in. So I just told it to show me all the columns here, but we do pd.dataframe. And here you have a list of columns. So that's with the square brackets, remember a list of columns. And we're gonna do a, uh, a, like a little dictionary here of key value pairs. So column one, its values are every sinset. Column two is part of speech, get the sinset dot part of speech noun, verb, adjective. Column three is our definition, so we do dot definition. Column four is the lemma. Lemma, remember, is kind of the root word. So fruitful, the lemma is fruit. And then an example. And what we're doing is looping over that. So each key value pair, so this column has this value, is looped over every sinset that is possible in our fruit set of words. So we have one, two, three, four, five possible pieces that we're pulling. Okay? And we're looping over each one of those sense sets and grabbing the sense set name, the part of speech, the definition, the lemma, and an example. So this is where we've combined almost everything. The only thing we don't have here is a tuple. Right, so we have a list, a dictionary, and a loop. And it returns, returns this data frame. So the first version of fruit is a noun. Here's our definition, the ripened, ripened reproductive body of a seed plant. This is like strawberries, like what we think about as fruit. Its lemma is actually fruit, and there's no example. Okay. And then here's one with an example. So this is sin set number three, fruit as a noun. Okay. The amount of product. So, oh, I'm sorry, number three. The consequence of some effort or action. So he lived long enough to see the fruit of his labor. Let's see example. So we can see all the definitions for fruit and their um, examples. And then I had it reprint definitions so we could see that a little better, but um, it printed out completely. Sometimes Markdown doesn't love to print pandas data frames, but I got it to work okay. Now that's cool. What can I do with that? Well. One thing we can look at is what's called textual entailment. Textual entailment is the relationship between some sort of text and a hypothesis, right? So let's say a hurricane hit Peter's town. That's our text. The hypothesis might be that the town was damaged because we know something about hurricanes. They damage things. <laughs> Having lived through it, they damage things. <laughs> so how can we make a system that recognizes entailment? Well, you can kind of do this with WordNet. This particular hurricane example, maybe not, but entailments are coded into WordNet and we can pull them from the sunset using dot entailments. Okay. 
And there may be more than one sin set, but in this example, I'm just going to pull the first one. Remember that Python's a zero index language, so we're just going to grab that first one. So for each action, walk, eat, and digest, let's find the sin set where that part of speech is a verb. Okay, so I'm just showing you some extra stuff here. I can grab all of the um, parts of speech by leaving it blank or I can grab a specific part of speech by filling in the um, part of speech type here. And this says just grab the first one. Okay, so why would I do that? Well, first this makes this example easier, <laughs> but also by grabbing the first one, we are grabbing probabilistically the most likely one because the dictionary or sense definitions in WordNet are listed in probability order. So it, pick, it has the most probable one first, then the second most probable one, then the third. When you look at them online, it shows you the most probable order within noun and like uh, here a noun and verb. But let's go back to fruit, for example. It separates them, right, noun and verb. But if you look at um, the way it actually pulls the data, so I got to back up here. Notice um, it still does it in, in order. So we've got the most probable version of noun first and the most probable version of verb first. We don't really totally have information about which um, word type is more probable, right? So one thing we can do to test this theory is just try a word we know is more probable as a verb, like eat. Okay, okay ver eat is apparently only a verb. Walk. Okay. Now, the question here is, does it always list noun first? Let's try run. It looks like it. So at the moment, we don't have any good information about um, which is more likely, noun or verb. But it does put them in probability order within those categories. And so when I ask for the first one here, what I'm getting is the most likely definition because it's the most probable. All right, and then I just have it print. So if it has an entailment, not all objects have entailments. In this case, these three were picked because they do, but walk entails stepping. And yeah, that makes sense. So if I'm walking, there are steps happening. Eat entails chewing and swallowing digest entails consuming. So these are things that uh, naturally go together. So when I'm doing this action, these other actions are also taking place. Okay. So if I wanted to do hurricane, I could see if hurricane entails damage. And we can kind of look, I don't think so in this, um, did I close it? No, here it is. I don't think it does because that is more of an implicit question um, but, you know, here they have the definition of hurricane, a severe tropical cyclone, usually with heavy rains and winds moving very fast. And let's see if we can see all options here. Now, I will tell you also that the, um, the online version can be difficult to read because it doesn't necessarily show you all the parts as nicely as the, um, Python version. So we said something about eat a minute ago, right? Let's see, taking solid food. So I don't really see entailments on here. We'd have to pull it and then break it down. Okay. All right, so that's one way we could figure out textual entailment. Textual entailment actually has like a whole competition every year about how to interpret these things. So there, it is more complicated than simply pulling the dictionary definition, but that's one way we could think about it. Some other types of relationships that we can look at are homonyms. Homonyms have the same written form and pronunciation, but they have different meanings. So bank here is written and spoken the same way every single time, but look at all the definitions for bank. Bank is one of the like most. It's an example in nearly every linguistic lecture I've used because it has so many different meanings and easily could be a noun or a verb. 
and has very des disparate meanings, right? So it could be the like kind of riverbank or it could be the money bank. Homographs are the same written form but different pronunciations or meanings. And this is like uh, wind uh, versus wind, right? So wind is one, you know, blowing air kind of definition. Wind is like to wind a clock spoken differently and different definitions, okay? but they look the same. So homo meaning same, graphs meaning written the same way. Homonyms look the same and are pronounced the same way, but have different meanings. We could think about synonyms and antonyms. So synsets are what we've been doing. That's the whole point for synonym. So words with similar meanings. Antonyms are basically the opposite, like off on. And so I'm going to grab the synset here for large and just think about large as an adjective. I know this is the first definition. You could put them in a data frame to find the one you're looking for. But let's say, okay, large is an adjective. The lemma is the word large, okay. but it also is big. So this right away tells us a synonym. So when large is an adjective, it can be large or big. And then we can also do an antonym. Okay, it looks crazy, but you're saying the first sin set, which is you know an adjective definition, and let's take the second lemma, big. So what's the opposite of, I'm sorry, the first lemma. What's the opposite of the literal word large? And that would be small. Okay, so what's, let's break down just one real quick, what's happening here? We pulled the entire sin set list for large. And if I go back over here, I can look at this. It's got a lot, okay. And we say, okay, well, there's a noun version. Let's look at the adjective. Let me turn off. There we go. Um, this is zero. Here's number one. It's definition. Uh, show examples. There we go. Um, I don't know how to get it back to normal. Let's just try refreshing. I'm trying to like get it back to the default here. <laughs> there we go. With the definitions, there we go. So the first one is a garment size. The second one is a above average in size or number or quantity or magnitude or extent. Whew. Okay. Now, what? What we're seeing here is we don't want this one. We want um, definition number one, okay, which is the second one down. And that sense that has two words. It's either large or big. And these two are synonymous, so they're concluded together. And then what I'm gonna do is given large or big, let's pick large by picking the zero here. And what's the antonym of that? It's small. So the reason that we have to kind of have three functions going on here is we want only the adjective sense using the exact word large and not the antonym for big, although it should be the same. And the antonym here is small. So that makes sense, right? Small, large. And here's another example. This time we're gonna pull several things at once instead of just doing one. So we're gonna grab the term here is gonna be rich and we're gonna grab the first three definitions. So remember that this is uh, up to, but not including the number. So it's zero, one, two. And then for each of those sense sets, what we're gonna do is print out the first lemma, the sense set, Okay, for that first lemma. Okay, hold on, I'm trying to make sure I understand. Yeah, so grab the lemma, print out the sin set for each lemma, and then print out the antonyms for each of the first words in those. And, when, and it's just gonna print down here. So for the first one, it is rich people. The definition is people who have possessions and wealth. The antonym is poor people. That makes a lot of sense. 
the next one down, oh, and then the definition here for the um, antonym is people without possessions. The second one is rich as an adjective, having material wealth. And then the second antonym is poor as an adjective, having no money. Rich as an adjective, part two, having an abundant supply of desirable qualities or substances. <laughs> this, then the next antonym is still poor, but look at the definition is different, lacking specific resources, qualities, or substances. So not only are we getting the right antonym, poor people versus poor, we're getting the specific right sense of the antonym, right? So rich here versus poor is about money, but rich here versus poor is about um, like land, right? It's oil rich or it's nutrient poor kind of thing. So we've looked at homophones, or sorry, homographs and homonyms. We've looked at synonyms and antonyms. One more confusing set of pairs, hyponyms and hypernyms. Hypernyms are things that are above in the hierarchy. Okay, they're more abstract. Whereas hyponyms are things that are more specific in the hierarchy. So let's say our base level word, sometimes called basic level naming, is dog. So we're at the dog level. Remember that a word net is organized in this hierarchy format. We're a dog. Okay. More, specific, more higher in the hierarchy might be something like animal, because the dog is an animal. Lower in the hierarchy might be my two small monsters that I own, um, which is more specific, like beagle. Now, this is just an example. Let's look at how WordNet is actually structured. Right? And I find this, this is like nearly impossible to see in the online version. So you have to use um, some code here to make this work. Right? So let's grab the sin set for dog and all versions of dog. And I printed them out so I could look at them. The noun is probably the one I want, but there's also some other interesting things going on, <laughs> right, frump. So let's look at that one here. Let me get this bigger. Okay, yeah. Dog is the one I want, right? Frump, a dull, unattractive, unpleasant girl or woman. Ooh, that's no fun, right? Or in formal terms, you lucky dog. But we want this first one, the actual like animal dog. Now to do this without looking at the dictionary, I could just print them out. I could put this all in a pandas data frame and write print them out. And here I want sin set number zero for number one. That's sort I of just saved it. Dog here. This is the definition that I want. So I can get the hypernyms, the words above it. Okay, dog is connected to two words above it, both canine and domestic animal. So it, it's got two hypernyms, things above it in the hierarchy. And the hyponyms, it's got a bunch. So things are, these are things below it in the hierarchy that it's connected to. And they're all different types of dogs. Okay, puppy, working dog, toy dog, hunting dog, corgi, cur, Dalmatian. Sort of interesting what is in here and what isn't, because there are lots of dog types, obviously. Why is that awesome? Right, why is this? is a relationship awesome? Because that's what's going on here. A dog is a canine and a great Pyrenees is a dog. So what's happening in the word net hierarchy is this is a relationship. Well, that's awesome because what we can do is start to track the hierarchical path of how words are connected to each other in meaning by tracking these paths of hypo and hypernyms. And so we can say, okay, here's a path. How do I get from the very top node all the way down to dog? Like, what does that path look like? Since dog is connected to two words above it, there will be two paths. Um, what you can see is you get a list of lists here. Where is it in? Uh, here. So this is path number one, and this is path number two. And one interesting thing about path depth here is it tells you how specific an item is. 
So items that have a very small path depth are abstract, more abstract, and things that have a long path depth are more concrete in the sense that they are more specific. So if I picked a type of dog, the number would be even higher. If I picked entity, that is very abstract. <laughs> and so it's at the very top. So notice here, the entity is always the top most word in the hierarchy. Well, we went from entity to physical entity, to object, to whole, to living thing, to organism, animal, chordate, vertebrate, vertebrae, mammal, placental, carnivore, canine, dog. And this one goes in the same basic path until you get to animal and then it becomes shorter. So I could measure how um, abstract terms are by working my way through the hierarchy. But um, that path thing we're gonna come back to in a couple minutes. So hold on to the path thing. All right, so as a recap, synonyms and antonyms, hyper, wait, homonyms and hypograph, uh, homographs, bleh, homonyms and homographs, right? Words have different definitions, but they either look or sound the same. Uh, synonyms and antonyms, hypernyms and hyponyms, which is moving up and down in the hierarchy. And now we've got holonyms and meronyms, which are very different. So holonyms are, are, are like a name for a collection. So if you ever heard the joke about a, a collection of zebras, it's called a zazzle. I don't know if that's true. It's just like one of these things that I just have in my head, but a collection of trees is definitely a forest, right? We could pull those collection names. Other than thinking this is cool, I'm not sure what I would do with it. Um, it, might in, it might help me with textual entailment because if things are connected that way, they're definitely entailed. So I grab the sin set for tree. I can see that I've got a you know, good number of definitions and I tree as a verb, which is very strange, but let's look at tree as a noun. And so I printed out the first definition here, a tall woody plant, blah, 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 tree stuff. That's what I want. So I say, okay, give me the tree sin set and tell me the holonyms. Okay. So the tree is a member of a forest. Cool. So these are um, understanding uh, collections of objects. So many, um, many lines or pride, that kind of thing. Meronym is the like parts of an object. So what makes up a tree? Well, a tree is made up of limbs, a stump, a trunk, a specific type of wood here, or the crown. Okay, and these are part meronyms. And then they also have what are called substance meronyms. And these are definitely the like inside of the tree. So in any of these cases, in any of these relationships, what we're understanding is the semantics. If they're either opposites, they're antonyms. If they're the same, they're synonyms. They are parts and components, that's holonyms and meronyms. Okay. Um, they're the same word, but have different definitions. That's holonyms and holographs. And so what we're getting at here is ways to tease apart words that um, are ambiguous. Okay, so word sense disambiguation is a very difficult task. But if I can, if I have all these pieces about the words, I can start to use the context clues. So if in a sentence tree talks about limb, okay, I know which definition of tree you're going for now because it is a part, meronym part of definition number one. So using all of these components, we can start to build a, a system. Okay, something just fell off the wall. <laughs> we can start to use a system that would allow us to disambiguate uh, ambiguous, like, figure out what the context is for specific words and be able to know their definitions. So when you hover over a word and click define, this can help you figure out which definition you should pick. All right, <laughs> sorry, made me jump. All right, now shades of meaning are really difficult, right? So we already saw how many different meanings the word fruit has, the word tree has, the word cheese has. So 
given that hierarchical structure, we could now begin to calculate similarity between words, between concepts that aren't in the same sin set. Okay. So like dog and cat are very similar words that are not part of the same sin set because they're not synonyms. They're similar words, not synonyms. Okay. And so they're you know, things like computer and mouse. They share meaning because they're used together, right? But they're not definitely not synonyms. <laughs> I cannot exchange one for the other. And so the, the structure of this network being hierarchical in nature allows me to calculate similarity between two separate concepts um, by using their paths, okay? So we could do kind of lowest common denominator, which would be the most common hypernym between the two. And the closer the hypernym is to the words, the more similar they are. Okay. And then we can also calculate literal path distance. So we'll go to that in a second. So looking at an example here, we're going to grab the definition for tree again. Okay, it's the same tree. Going to grab the definition for lion. And this part here is not necessary. This is just me making sure I'm getting the one I'm interested in. So yes. This is the lion that roars. And then I'm gonna grab one for cat, feline mammal with thick, soft fur, no ability to roar, okay. um, sleeps all the time, uh, you know, tracks cat litter all over the house, can be a jerk, etc. cetera. Um, so we've got three words here, tree, lion, and cat. Lion and cat should probably be fairly similar. The rest of them should be unrelated to tree. So can we figure that out? One way we can do this is think about the lowest common hypernym. Remember, hypernym is the one above it. And the lowest common hypernym, so the closer it is to the word, the more related they are. But we can also use this as a comparison point. So what I do is here is tree dot lowest common hypernym to lion. And the answer is organism. Tree dot lower co lowest common hypernym to cat is also organism. So tree is similarly related to cat as it is to lion, okay, meaning not at all. Organisms way up there in the, in the hierarchy. Okay, well, what about lion's lowest common hypernym to cat? Well, that's feline. So that's probably pretty close. But none of these are numbers. Right, we have to maybe figure out path depths. So we could calculate the lowest common hypernym and do path depth, or we can just do a simpler function and do path similarity. So how similar is the path from the start to tree or, or from entity to tree as entity to lion? Okay, and that's pretty low. Path similarity from tree to cat, also pretty low. And then lion to cat is higher. And I do think you have to look, you can't treat this number like a correlation or even a proportion match. It is, um, I, wait, I waited, I believe. But when you have a bunch of them, you can tell which ones are more related and which ones are less related. So lion is more related to cat than it is to tree. Now, some other similarity measures that I think are more popular because they're a little bit more interpretable and my favorite's gonna be JCN similarity, but there's Lin similarity, Resonac as well. There's a bunch. What you do is you import the um, information criterion function, or it's not a function, it's a dictionary. You import this information criterion information <laughs> that's stored in the background. And you use these different calculations. So each of these, what it does is it takes the number of hops between items. So how far do I have to go if I'm starting at tree up and over to get to cat, right? So tree, I got to go to the lowest common hypernym and then back down. So how many hops does it take? So there's one form of JCN that's literally a count. It's one hop because it's one item over, or it's one, can, you know, it's the next piece connected to it, or it's 37 hops because they're about as far apart as you can get. I don't remember the exact number, but it's pretty high. Or you can convert that into a similarity measure 
which means zero, no similarity. They're very far apart to one, very high similarity, they're close together. So it's kind of more correlational style. And they're, they're structured in distance format, so they can't be negative. Okay, so from tree to lion, we get about 0.7. Lion to cat, we get about 0.35. This is not the same thing as past similarity. This includes an information criterion piece. Um, and so this has information about the item itself and how abstract it is. And there's a, the formulas, not just literally how many hops it is, but that's the basic idea. And so the numbers won't be exactly the same as path similarity. And it does matter which one you pick. That's one thing I wanna make cl super clear here. So for JCN, I would say this one's unrelated. This one's mildly related. But if you looked at lens similarity, um, tree to cat to lion is much higher. So 0.7 to 0.2, but correspondingly cat to lion is also much higher. So they're scaled in different ways. So just make sure you understand which one you're using. Now they're still mostly zero to one as a, as a concept because uh, we like correlation a lot and we like the scaling. Um, path distance similarity also is zero to one um, because it can't get more similar than perfectly the same. <laughs> but all of these will have slightly different formulas so they'll give you the same pattern results but different numbers so i can't give you a cutoff i can't say 0.5 is very similar because it depends on which one you pick so all of that taken together what we're going to look at for a couple slides to end this lecture is actually word sense disambiguation okay, before we get into named entity recognition so we, when we're reading or when we're hearing or we're doing any sort of linguistic interpretation, right? You listening to me now, you're gonna use the context clues of my sentences and the slides to help distinguish these different meanings. So, um, you know, when I'm talking to people and they, they're ambiguous, I can stop them right there and say, which one, which person, which day, right? You can disambiguate by asking a question. But when you're reading something, you just are hoping that there's some sort of clue in the sentences around it or the sentence within it, right? And so what search engines do, other than like literal word finding, right? Or the define function, like if you double click on a word and you ask it to define it, it is try to figure out based on the words around it, which definition it should be, right? So we're, we're using the, the pieces available to us in something like WordNet to disambiguate. And we have a lot of pieces, right? We have their synonyms, we have their antonyms, we have where they are in the hierarchy. So things that are close together in the hierarchy are very similar. We have their parts, their components, like we have a bunch of different pieces that we can look at. Okay. But one of the most popular ways to do this is called the LESC algorithm. And what it does simply is it looks at the dictionary definition of a word and sees if those dictionary definition words are in any of the, um, the sentence around it. So take this sentence, the fruits on the plant have ripened and find the dictionary definition that has some of those words. This seems like pretty obvious, like the words around it will tell you which word it is. So we're looking for overlap. That is not all it does, but that's the basic gist. So from NLTK um, dot WSD, import LESC for the LESC algorithm. We're also gonna import word tokenize. To make this work, you need two pieces. You need the, uh, the sentence and then the type, the part of speech. And so why did we spend so much darn time last week part of speech tagging? Okay. And it seems like a task that just takes a, you know, a minimal amount of effort if we're using an automatic part of speech tagger, but like, why do that? Well, here's a clue. To know, to do word sense disambiguation, you have to know what part of speech it is. So the reason that we spent forever talking about parts of speech is because at its core, it is a, a 
very important task for many of our other NLP tasks. Okay. For sentiment analysis, it's really handy if you know what the part of speech is. For uh, named entity recognition, most of those are nouns. So what we're doing here is we say, okay, take this sentence, the fruits on the plant have ripened, and I want the noun context for fruit, because that's what it is in this sentence. Versus finally reap the fruit of his hard work. And in this uh, case, actually, it's still a noun. We'll do one in a second that changes uh, type. So fruit here is the same word. Let's see if we can have the algorithm figure out which definition each one is. So for each sentence and part of speech tag, because we've got a tuple here, find the, find the sinset or um, the definition. We're going to use the LESC algorithm. We're going to pull out the sentence. So we just tokenized it to make LESC happy. In the LESC algorithm, you give it the, the tokens, comma, the token you're interested in, which here is fruit and the part of speech, which we pulled from here. So here's my sentence, tokenized. Here's the word I'm interested in, fruit. And here's the part of speech, noun. And then I just printed it out. What's the sentence? What, syn what synonym or definition set did it think it was? And what was the literal definition that it picked? So our sentence, the fruits on the plant have ripened, it picked Sinset fruit number one, because that definition is the ripened reproductive body of the seed plant. So did good. He finally reaped the fruit of his hard work and won the race. And this one's really great because um, it doesn't overlap in a, in a real strong word here. The sinset here is fruit number three, the consequence of some effort or action. Okay, so it doesn't perfectly overlap, but it's still correct. Let's look at one more example. And this time we're gonna change out the word type here. So lead is a very soft, malleable metal as a noun. John is the actor who plays the lead. So now we've got a homograph right? in that movie. It's also a noun. This road leads to nowhere. Oh, now it's a verb. So can we get these dictionary definitions correct? All this code is the same, where we're interested in using the LESC algorithm and we've just broken it down and told it's the word lead or led and which part of speech it is. And let's see, lead is a soft malleable metal. Well, the definition includes the word malleable and metal. So got that one right. John is the actor who plays the lead in that movie. Check it out. The sinset here is actually star. So we're starring in the movie, okay? an actor who plays a principal role. Awesome. This road leads to nowhere. And it looks weird because it says the sinset is run. But, you know, definition makes some sense, cause to pass or lead somewhere. So we're still getting the, the going somewhere part. So the LESC algorithm is really popular for words since disambiguation because one, it works really well, um, but it, it uses the, um, all those different context pieces. So, you know, when we started this lecture, we're kind of like, okay, well, she's talking about homographs, homonyms, melonyms, like there's all these different parts and pieces I can pull from WordNet, um, but they're all very handy. And this is one of the biggest ways that they're useful is disambiguation of, you know, a content word in a sentence the nouns, verbs, adjectives, or adverbs. All right. So we're going to stop there for this lecture and save name entity recognition for next week's lecture. Where we'll take that idea and then expand that into um, objects where we might be interested in the context, uh, or sometimes this is called chunking, where you grab um, entities and their relationships to each other in a sentence.